All right, is that better? I believe that was my fault. I take blame for that. Um, Sooner or later in life, you find this. You may say, Dale, what this is this? Well, it's this, this. Not every this is the same this, but this is the this that we're talking about today. Thus, it's important to listen to this. (laughs) Now, are you ready for me to close the sermon? Are you like, I'm not going to know what in the world he's talking about. I know Dell's been on morphine, but I think he's been doing a little more than that even. Yeah, well, anyway, we're talking about this. Because we have a statement that goes with this, and the statement that goes with this is simply this. This changes everything. You know, I think it's cool in life when you meet something, a truth, a person who changes everything. I met an 18-year-old girl one time, and that changed everything. You might have met someone like that one day. Uh, Everything can be changed by that statement, this changes everything, because the this that we are speaking of is the this of Christmas. In other words, Christmas changes everything. Now last weekend, Pastor Robbie shared with us about the importance of beauty that comes from Christmas. Christmas is a beautiful time. It lets us know that we are beautiful, and it lets us know that we are beautiful in our right time, and it lets us know that God's the one that makes us beautiful. And those are important things to know. But it all grows out of the reality of Christmas, which was a time when the Lord shows His beauty through Jesus Christ. In a few minutes today, I want to share with you another this. Another thing that grows out of this is beautiful. But for now, I'm going to tell you something strange. And that strange thing is that Christmas is controversial. You are aware of that, I hope. Christmas is quite controversial in our day and age. And the way it's controversial in recent years is there is today what you might call a war on Christmas. The billboard shows it. Atheists say, you know, it's a myth, this season celebrate reason. Well, I don't agree with that. I believe reason says that there is a God. I believe reason says that Jesus was born as my Savior. And in my reason, not because of someone else's mind, but because of what God has put into my heart to believe is true, I think the most reasonable thing in the world to believe is that Jesus came as the Savior. He was born for us. He lived for us. He died for us, He rose for us, He's coming again for us, and I embrace those truths. And I want to say this quite lovingly, and that is, not everybody is obligated to believe what I believe. But I have the right to believe what I believe without being insulted for it. So we have a war on Christmas. And, you know, one of the ways the war comes is, um, you know, things like, don't say Merry Christmas. Someone might be offended by that. All right? So somebody will say, well, just say Happy Holidays. Not Merry Christmas, just Happy Holidays. And yet I can tell you that offends me because I don't believe that Christmas is just a holiday. It is about Christ. So saying Merry Christmas brings the name of Christ in And that brings joy to my heart. That's my stand in the war on Christmas. Now this year there's been a big hoopla. And you know it's been about Starbucks. Now my wife loves Starbucks. At Christmas I buy gift cards from Starbucks for my wife. And I'm going to this year. Wait, I can't tell that. No, I'm not this year. But anyway, if I were to, I will feel free to because... Uh, because that's something she loves, Starbucks coffee. But the thing is that Starbucks normally puts uh, reindeer and Christmas trees and the words Merry Christmas on their cups. And this year they didn't. They just made the cups red. And a lot of Christians are in, upset saying, you know, it's kind of um, weird weird. Uh, that they didn't put the Christmas symbols. They must be against Christmas. 
And there's been a lot of arguing, a lot of insult about it all. Well, you know, you can choose to believe what you think on that. Maybe they thought by having red cups, that was all that was needed to say Merry Christmas. I don't know. I don't see anything wrong with the red cups. But if you're bothered by it, I respect that. But guys, here's what I want to do. I want to share with you a video that shows the war on Christmas in the reality of Starbucks cups. Josh Fierstein here. You know, I think in the age of political correctness, we become so open-minded, our brains have literally fallen out of our head. Do you realize that Starbucks wanted to take Christ and Christmas off of their brand new cups? That's why they're just plain red. In fact, do you realize that Starbucks isn't allowed to say Merry Christmas to customers? Well, I decided instead of simply boycotting, well, why don't we just start a movement? So when I went in and I asked for my coffee, they asked for my name, and I told them my name is Merry Christmas. So guess what? Starbucks I tricked you into putting Merry Christmas on your cup. And I'm challenging all great Americans and Christians around this great nation, go into Starbucks and take your own coffee selfie. And then I challenge you to not only share this video so that the word gets out, but let's start a movement. And let's call it, I don't know, hashtag Merry Christmas Starbucks. And I know that by sharing this video and getting other Christians to do it, well, I guarantee that we can make this go around the world. And Starbucks, guess what? Just to offend you, I made sure to wear my Jesus Christ shirt into your store. And since you hate the Second Amendment, I even carried my gun. Yikes. Anyways, guys, please take a moment. Choose to not be politically correct. Just correct. Share the video, like, comment. Well, anyway, applaud that. That's a cool video. But I think it's done a little tongue-in-cheek. I mean, I think there's a little humor intended in that. And what it is showing is sometimes how, uh, how funny our wars are. Well, someone else wanted to get embroiled in the war. They said, well, if you're going to have uh, arguments about red cups and Starbucks, maybe there's other things you ought to be uh, upset about also. So someone decided to show their Christmas uh, disappointment with taco seasoning. Hello, Internet. <clears throat> it's... Robert Hands, you know me. I don't make videos very often, but when I do, you know it's got to be important. So I was in the kitchen about to make my dinner, some tacos, um, and I saw something that just blew my mind. I'm glad I caught it because it's very important that I share this with you. I was about to make these tacos from McCormick, as you can see. Um, you can see there's some red and some green mixed in. There's some red, white, and blue in there. Uh, I'll let you know these are American tacos. But what concerned me was they've got the red and they've got the green. Um, and w There's no mention of Christmas on here. There's no mention of Jesus. And we bless our meals every day. So I want to know why McCormick thinks that they don't have to put Jesus and Christmas on our tacos. It is insane. What is this world coming to? Because, you know, when we don't have Jesus in our tacos, um, what's next, you know? Uh, so, these tacos, I, I, can't, I can't eat them. And it's not because they're too hot or spicy, but you know, you know what is too hot? Hell. That's right, McCormick. I'm not going to hell for your tacos. And that's it. Oh, um, I have a gun too. So, um... Yeah, don't eat devil tacos and put Jesus back in my tacos. Hello, Internet. <clears throat> it's Robert Hands. You know me. I don't make videos very often, but when I do, you know it's got to be important. So I was in the kitchen about to make my dinner, some tacos, um, and I saw something that just blew my mind. I'm glad I caught it because it's very important that I share this with you. I was about to make these tacos from McCormick, as you can see. Um, you can see there's some red and some green mixed in. There's some red, white, and blue in there. Uh, I'll let you know these are American tacos. But what concerned me was they've got the red and they've got the green. Um, and there's no mention of Christmas on here. There's no mention of Jesus. And we bless our meals every day. So, I want to know why McCormick thinks that they don't have to put 
put Jesus and Christmas on our tacos. It is insane. What is this world coming to? Because, you know, when we don't have Jesus in our tacos, um, what's next? You know? Uh, so, these tacos, I, I, can't, I can't hear them. And it's not because they're too hot or spicy. But you know, you know what is too hot? Hell. That's our performance. I'm not going to hell for your tacos. And that's it. Oh, um, I've got two. So, um, yeah, don't eat devil tacos. And put Jesus back in my tacos. Now, guys, I'm going to tell you, you can choose for yourself if you're going to be a part of the war on Christmas or fighting back in the war on Christmas. And if you don't really understand very much about it, go to Fox News and listen to Bill Riley and you'll know all about it, Bill O'Reilly. But the fact is, Christmas is a controversial thing, which is amazing in light of the fact that Christmas changes everything and when it reveals the beauty of God like uh, we shared with you last week that is great you know today I want to share with you another truth about Christmas that is great how Christmas changes everything and that is Christmas reveals the oneness of the human race hey I want to hear an amen out of that amen. guys Christmas reveals the oneness of of the human race. I celebrate that because there is way too much division in the human race today. And the division in the human race is often based on ridiculous things. And that can be color, that can be mindset, that can be culture. And I believe that the Bible says Jesus loves us all equally because we are all of equal value in the sight of God. When Jesus died on the cross, he died for us all. And, and people talk today about what do we do about racism? I want to tell you guys, I believe there's only one solution for racism. And I believe the answer for racism doesn't come in television documentaries. It doesn't come in legislation by the Congress. I believe the only thing that brings the races of people together is to bring people together in the person of Jesus Christ. So what are we going to do? What are we going to do about all the struggle and strife in this world? We're going to point out to people, God loves you, Jesus died for you, and we are one through Jesus. It's a beautiful thing. Jesus and Christmas reveal the oneness of the human race. Now guys, in talking about this, I'm walking on dangerous ground. There's always the possibility of saying things in a way that come out wrong. And if I do that, please forgive me. I just want you to understand my heart. I am colorblind. Family Life Church is colorblind. We do not care what race someone is because we see them all equal in the eyes of God. And if you're white, if you're black, if you're Hispanic, if you're American Indian like my wife, if you're whatever it may be, it doesn't matter to me what matters to me and what matters to this church because it's what matters to God and that is we are all creations of God that He loves dearly. Amen. It's amazing. Do we have the slide? Yeah, Christmas reveals the oneness of the human race. It's amazing how people get caught up in differences. There are differences in race. There are differences within a single race. Tony Romo's a great quarterback. Matt Castle's not so good. You may say, Dell, who are you talking about? Don't worry about it. If you don't know now, you're not going to know later. I have brothers who were very muscular growing up. I was a skinny wimp back then. Okay, still am. <laughs> you were thinking it. You were thinking it. We're all the same race. Now, some were a little bothered by something I shared last night, but I, I was just trying to make a point. 
a lot of people point out differences in races. And one of the differences was brought out in the 1800s by Dr. Samuel Cartwright. He discovered differences within the races between uh, African Americans and, and whites. He called it a disease, dropatomania, again, no offense intended, but the way he said it was, it was the tendency of Negro slaves to run away from plantation houses. He said the blacks run away from plantation houses and the white don't run away from plantation houses. See, there are differences in the race. Well, I believe I'd run away from the plantation house also if I were in the place of the slaves. I mean, maybe it has something to do with cotton fields. Maybe it has something to do with beanies. Maybe it has something to do with rape. Guys, uh, it is ridiculous that that was seen as a difference in the races. Uh, you know how close the races are, whatever the color of skin may be. There's a number wrong on this slide, but let me look at it. The races, 99.98% the same. You say, Dale, that's not what that number says. No, it's 99.98% because a skinny preacher who hangs out around this church made a mathematical error when he made this slide. The correct is 98.98%, which means there's virtually no difference at all between people of different races. So, you know, when someone will say, well, how can we be one human race when we are so different? The answer simply is, there's not that much difference at all, and we need to take our eyes off of differences and put our eyes on the bridges that unite the human race. And you may say, well, Dale, what difference does it make? Well, let me just point out something from Scripture. Let me point out to you that in the Christmas story, in the Christmas story, all the races were involved. Joseph and Mary, they were Jews. King Herod, he was a half-breed, half Jew and half the Edomite, a Gentile, non-Jewish nation. Um, the wise men from the East, were Arab or Persian. Um, they were the Roman soldiers. They were European. They were white. You got all the races of men in the Christmas story. And so it shows that Christmas was a worldwide interracial event and it shows the oneness of the human race. Now again, you may say, why does it matter? Well, why does it matter? Well, one is... Because racism, the saying there are differences in the races, can destroy someone's self-esteem. Sometimes somebody looks down on themselves because they are not just like somebody else. Self-esteem can be attacked. Secondly, I'll tell you why it matters. Prejudice matters. It stirs up war and terrorism. People are not as close to each other as they ought to be. Often, because of race and racial barriers. And then a third one, and that is this. Racial prejudice can block the gospel. If you're saying that I'm different than you, I don't want to listen to what you have to preach, someone may say. And the simple fact is, the gospel is for everyone. The gospel, the good news, is for everyone. And so don't be close to the gospel. Let me put it in other words. Christianity is not a white man's religion. Nor is Christianity a Jewish religion. And I want to say, guys, I thank God that Family Life Church is an interracial church. I would love for it to be more so an interracial church because I want anybody who comes here to know this. We don't see the differences in the human race. We see the oneness that we have in Jesus Christ. I'm glad to have Chelsea Whitley on our staff. Chelsea, you got anything funny to say today? No. <laughs> Nothing? Are you going to be any in the skits coming up? You don't want to be? Not really. What is it that you call me? P. Diddy. P. Diddy. 
Why do you call me P. Diddy? Why do you think Robbie Ashlock, of all people, ought to be your role model? <laughs> all right. I believe it is so cool to have Chelsea as one of the staff members of our church. She adds so much to the spiritual and emotional fiber of this congregation. You know, we, we don't care if someone has a different skin color. So you got a little bit more melanin in your skin than somebody else has. Who cares? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to God. It doesn't matter to us. My wife tells me that her ancestors were on the shore waiting to greet my ancestors when they arrived at the new world. Well, that might be the case. You know, Linda's great-grandmother was full-blood ch- uh, Cherokee. We have a picture of her at our house. You can tell she is the Indian. Full-blood Cherokee. She died at Tucumcari, and they wouldn't bury her in the cemetery because she wasn't white. So they buried her just outside the perimeter of the cemetery. We were over there a few years ago when Linda's uncle died, and we were looking for a great-grandmother's grave. We knew they buried her just outside the cemetery. What they didn't figure on was the cemetery growing. <laughs> and right now, Linda's great-grandmother's grave is right in the middle of the Tucumcari Cemetery. <laughs> it is so sad, the differences that people try to point out. And those differences can block the gospel because someone's heart may be closed. You, do you know why? Do you know why in the mid-1800s, from then on, the whites were called the majority of the human race, uh, uh, the majority of the American people? It wasn't because we're better than someone else. It would just happen to be because there were more of us than anyone else. You know, when you're the majority in number, you can kind of set the rules. But guys, America and Texas are becoming more and more Hispanic. And we who are white are probably going to be in the minority 30 years down the road. And I thank God that we have a lot of Hispanics in our church because when a lot of these white churches are withering because they will not accept other races, family life is going to say yes to any race and we're going to keep on growing. (laughs) That is cool. That is cool. And that's God's heart. So guys... One of the great things about Christmas that changes everything is the oneness of the human race through Christmas. I urge you to believe in that. You may say, Dale, I've never heard a Christmas sermon on racism. Well, it's about time we hear it because it's true to the Word of God. And in fact, let's look at some more scripture. Let's look at this scripture on the screen. Here's what Christ says. And I, when I'm lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. Who do you suppose he meant by all people? I believe he meant all people. Yeah, whatever the race. He didn't line it out on specific races. Another, uh, another slide, another scripture. This is from Acts 10, 34 and 35. Opening his mouth, Peter said, I certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality. But in every nation, that means every race, the man who fears God, who fears Him, and does what is right, is welcome to Him. God accepts people from every race when they say yes to Jesus Christ. Let's look at another slide. Colossians 3.11 There is no distinction No difference. No different way we're going to treat people. No different way we're going to reward people. No different way that we're going to respect people. There is no distinction between Greek and Jew. Different races. Circumcised and uncircumcised. That's even different religions. Barbarian, Scythian, slave, and free man. But Christ is all and in all. There is no distinction between different people, including different races. All right, another scripture. 
for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who will call on Him. For whoever will be called, uh, who will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. So guys, the Bible makes very clear. The human race is one race. The people of the human race are one people. Color is not an issue. Uh, Racial characteristics are not an issue. Geographical background is not an issue. And whatever your color, whatever your background, we love you with all of our hearts. And Family Life Church loves you with all of our hearts because Jesus loves you with all of his heart. And he died for you on the cross. Okay, guys. I want you to respond sometime by giving me a hearty applause and not me, but the truth that's being said. We are all one people in Jesus Christ. Do you agree with that? Let's hear it. One other scripture. And I want you to turn there. You brought your device or your Bible. Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2 tells the story of an old man who hung out at the temple in Jerusalem in the days of Joseph and Mary, in the days of the first Christmas. This old man had been told by God that he would never die until he saw the Messiah, the Savior. And he hung out at the temple because one day Jesus was going to show up. And Jesus is born. And Joseph and Mary bring Jesus to the temple. And this man sees him, and the Holy Spirit says... This is him. This is the Messiah. And Simeon is ready to die. Look at verse 29. Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation. Christ is our salvation. I've seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations. A light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. A light for the Gentiles, non-Jewish people racially. A light for the Jews, Jewish people racially. What Simeon is saying is this. I've seen the one that's going to bring all nations together. And he is going to bring all nations together by being our salvation. And the whole point that Simeon is making is Christmas is about the oneness of the human race. Because it's shown through God-given Jesus for all men. Do you see that? Do you see? It's a Christmas issue. It's how Christmas changes everything. Now, let me move from there to talk about all this in practical words. How in the world can you and I make a difference? There's a lot of people that get involved in the racial issue by things that are put on Facebook, by statements that are made. I want to give you some practical suggestions that I believe are important for God's people to practice in light of the racial problem that our world has. And number one is friendliness. Let's make sure anytime someone comes to family life that we speak to them. And it doesn't just have to be if it's a racial difference. You know, the book of James says, if someone who's poor come to your church, you ought to welcome that person who is poor. Let's make sure every poor person who comes to this church is welcomed here. Let's be friendly to them. Let's make sure everyone that's old is welcomed here. Let's make sure everybody who's young is welcome here. Let's make sure everybody who has piercings is welcome here. Let's make sure everybody who has tattoos is welcomed here. If we took out everyone with tattoos, there wouldn't be a family life church. (laughs) Let's make sure everybody who's sick is welcome here. And let's make sure if the pastor of the church gets really sick and has to hang out at the hospital every week, that we love him anyway, because it's not about whether you're sick or well. It is about the health we have through the blood of Jesus Christ. Let's remember 
the love that we show. And by the way, guys, I want to say thank you for the openness that you guys have shown to me. I've spent a lot of time at home in the last several months. I've spent a lot of time trying to get over some pain. I've spent a lot of time taking morphine and chemotherapy and other things that have been going on in my life. And I just want to say, I am glad I have a church. When I come to that church, people are going to love me and they're going to say, Dale, you're getting really skinny. And I can say, yeah, eat your heart out because they want to get skinny and they're jealous of me. Losing 45 pounds can make a guy pretty good looking. <laughs> and I'm doing everything in the world I can to gain 45 pounds back. And I gained a whole pound this week. So I'm working on But acceptance, friendliness, saying hi. Uh, you know, if you're walking down the sidewalk, someone of another race walks by, nod at them, smile at them. Not acknowledge them. Someone walks in the doors of this church, whatever race they are, acknowledge them. Let it be that it does not matter what someone's demographic is like. We're going to love them. We're going to show the love of Jesus. Second thing, spend time together. I like hanging out with Chelsea, even if she does call me P. Diddy. <laughs> now, I have to admit, my hanging out with Chelsea is around the church and, you know, and all that. But um, she's one of the delights of our lives. She's got a cool personality. Even if she hangs around Robbie Ashlock sometimes, it all <laughs> works out really good. And that's going the wrong direction, Robbie, and I don't mean that. You know, I love you. <laughs> the simple fact is, time together with people that are different. I think that leads me to number three. Number three ought to be learn. Let's see if it is. Learn. Learn from, learn from other people. I've noticed that there are some traits that different races have that are slightly different. And the one that I'm jealous of especially, there are certain races that are more athletic than I am or, you know, whites may be. And, and I think we ought to learn from them. I think we can learn a lot more about taking care of our bodies and about developing our muscles and about running fast. And those are positive differences and we can embrace that. We ought to learn. I think we can learn from the culture of others. I think we can learn from the mindset of others. I think that we can learn from others and we ought to do that. It'll make us richer. Family Life Church is richer because we're an interracial church and not a single race church. And we are blessed in that way. And we want to continue to be open to that. Amen. And then there's a fourth thing. And that is share the gospel. Share the good news. Jesus died for everyone. We ought to tell, it's the Christmas message. We ought to tell people, Jesus was born at Bethlehem. He died for you. He loves you. You believe in Him, and He will say yes to you for salvation. Share the Christmas message. You know what, guys? The biggest favor you'll ever do for anyone in your life is to tell someone else about the love of Christ. Let's tell them about the love of Christ. Shown in Christmas. Now I'm going to close with the story. I want to back up and say this. There's always a danger of preaching on a touchy subject of saying the wrong thing. I hope nothing I've said has come out in any uh, inappropriate way because my heart is one of purity. Because we are, I am, colorblind. And we will always embrace people, whatever the race may be, because that is the heart of God. That is our delight. And we want you to know, if you're a part of our church or a guest today, we love you with all of our hearts. I want to tell you about a man who used to be a part of Family Life Church. And I'm going to tell you how God taught me to practice what I preached on this morning. His name was Raul. You might guess his racial makeup. Raul Gonzalez. Raul Gonzalez became a member of our church about 18 years ago. 19, maybe 20 years ago. Had a beauty shop. He was a hairdresser. He had a beauty shop named exclusively Raul. 
Any of you ladies ever heard of that years ago? Today, his sister, who's a part of our church, operates that beauty shop. It's called Exclusively Rose. Raul, like I said, was Hispanic. Obviously, we accepted him. We loved him. Wonderful man of God. Raul had another problem. I say another problem. Race wasn't a problem. That's, that's how it is. You can say the wrong thing. Uh, uh, he had a problem. Raul had AIDS because of his lifestyle and his background. But he was a member of our church. He had accepted Christ as Savior, loved the Lord with all of his heart, and anything in his background was not an issue because God's heart of grace is big enough to cover all sins and lifestyles. Raul was in the hospital because he was dying. Sometimes he was out of the hospital and he would be with us. I would go by his beauty shop sometime just to say hi. And Raul would say, Dale, I want to give you this. I hope you don't mind. You better not have one. And he would hand me a $100 bill. I tried to go to his beauty shop as often as I could. (laughs) Friendliness is very important. (laughs) Raul had had a line of beauty products. He said, this product, every penny I make from this product goes to Family Life Church. And he was true to that many years ago. One night I got a call that Roe was dying. He was in ICU at BSA. And I went to the hospital to see him one last time. I went in his room there in ICU. He said, Dale, they tell me I'm not going to live through the night. I want you to pray me into heaven. He wasn't expecting me to save him. He just wanted me to pray with him as he made that journey. He reached up with his hand that had the IV in it. That was the blood running down his hand. And with that hand, he took my hand. I didn't have time to evaluate the risk of infection. Here was a brother in Christ who needed to be loved and needed to be prayed over And uh, I took his hand. And I held Raul's hand. And I prayed for him. He didn't die that night. He lived two more weeks. During those two weeks, he told me he had a vision. He said, Dale, I was in Jerusalem. The angels of God were there. He said, Dale, you were there. I was there. And and he told the vision. It was a cool, cool story. He was a good man. A man of God. Some of you may be sitting there saying, Dell, are you implying anything? I am implying that God is a God of grace and it doesn't matter what your race is, it doesn't matter what your lifestyle is, it doesn't matter what mistakes it may be, God loves you, Jesus died for you. That's what I'm implying. And I'm implying something else, and that is if someone is different than we are, that should not be a barrier to us loving them in the name of Christ. That's what I'm implying. So that night I prayed for him. And, you know, I didn't worry much about it. Yeah, I've had tests later. No infection, no contact. It is all all right. Uh, but uh, Royal died. In our old church location, the movie theater at Western Plaza, I preached his funeral. It's a big crowd. A lot of people in Amarillo knew Raul. A lot of people came, and I said... How many of you were led to Jesus Christ by Raul? And hands all over the room went up. His sister was here last night. She's part of our church, Rose. Others in the family. She came up to me after church and she said, He led me to the Lord also. And she thanked me for telling this story. Because it illustrates so well We don't love people if we're all the same. We love people regardless of differences or imagined differences. We are not builders of barriers. 
We are builders of bridges. We do not see Christmas as a white man's holiday. It's not just for Christians. If somebody from China wants to celebrate Christmas, that is awesome. I hope they learn about Jesus through it. And if someone from Mexico wants to celebrate Christmas and give me some tamales, I hope they do that. (laughs) They ought to celebrate. And I thank God today for Christmas because Christmas changes everything. Amen. Let's celebrate that. And now let's bow our heads. I've shared this message with joy. Even though I've tried to share the message carefully. And I believe in, and I thank God for, the gracious spirit that you've received what I've said. No, it's probably not a typical Christmas message. But it ought to be every year. You can see why. But guys, it's important to respond to the reality that Christ was born at Christmas to bring together, to reveal the oneness of all races of man. My desire is for this church to always believe in that truth and to minister in a way that shows it. I hope that if you've ever felt ostracized in any way at our church, you will let me know. You will let the leadership know because we do welcome you. Whatever your race, whatever your lifestyle, whatever your background, we are all one people in Christ. Father, I ask you that you'll make us strong and believe in this truth. I thank you, Father, there is no distinction. No distinction in your heart and no distinction in our hearts. Now, Father, we believe that Jesus died on the cross for all. So everybody in this room needs to make sure that their faith is in Jesus Christ. And guys, I want to say to you, look into your heart and ask yourself, do you believe Jesus died for you? And are you accepting Him as your Savior? If you have not, right now you ought to pray and invite Him into your life. Guys, I want to say this. You never know when a diagnosis will go wrong. You don't know. You don't know when the doctor will have devastating news for you. You don't know when you might read online about statistics and find out that the odds of living very long are very slight. You don't know. You don't know what tomorrow holds. You don't know when disease will come or when it will be kept away. You do not know when there will be an accident, a sliding on the ice, a slipping on the snow. You don't know when it'll happen. Make sure today that your faith is in Jesus Christ. You don't know what today itself will bring. But I do know one thing. If you right now invite Jesus into your heart and ask Him to be your Savior, He will be your Savior. He will be your Savior when you slip. He'll be your Savior when the diagnosis comes in. And when others say, it's sad, you may not live, you can say, nothing to that. My life is eternal. It is set on the rock of Jesus Christ. You can know for sure if you're standing on the rock that stands for sure. I beg of you today, accept Jesus as your Savior. Father, we love you, and we thank you for the forgiveness you offer at all times. Thank you that we're one. And in heaven, it's not going to be a gathering of races. It's going to be the human race and the angels and you. And we'll celebrate forever. And we celebrate today that truth. 
We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.